All right, maybe we should get started. Um, so I will just review where we are. I say at any, at any stage, ask me questions. Everybody has their audio switched on. Okay. So I just wanted to first go through the website for this class with the um, the overall website is shown here, cyber training. And then we have a list of material, including this course. And that course, of course, lists the material here. Now, the most, probably the most useful is the, uh, is the module, which is the course lectures which is shown here. And it's organized by week and has linked in the videos for the, for, for which are recorded for each of the Zooms, which is the initial introduction. And it summarizes the assignments, but the assignments are um, also given in, in course announcements from Canvas. So we're at week three, which is the use case survey, which I'll come to. Um, previous week, I said some homeworks involving just getting used to CODAP. And there are three modules which are connected to CODAP. There is one here, the Google CODAP module is just a collection of videos about using CODAP. CODAP is really easy to use. so. I'm not certain it needs these videos, but you just log in and type. Um, there is um, one called um, Python warm-up. And this has, um, this module has at the top something called open in Colab, which if you click, will open this page in Colab. And when you open this page, you should make your own copy. So you go to file, save a copy and drive. All right, now it's called copy of Python warmup. You can change the name to anything you like. And now you can do anything here you like. So here we have, um, for i equals uh, i in the range of 0 to 10, we can change that to 20. And then we can click here. And then we'll list the numbers 0 to 19 and so on. So this is really simple Python instruction. So it's just partly to show you how to use CODAP, which is really easy, and partly an uh, introduction to Python. The other um, aspect of CODAB you'll want is the runtime, and you'll sometimes want to do a run all, which starts at the beginning and then runs all the, all the cells through to the end. When I'm debugging, I often use, um, let's do um, change this thing here. C equals B times 10. We'll multiply it by 20. And then we could just rerun this particular cell. So we could just um, run after, which runs all cells, including this one, but doesn't rerun the previous cells. All right, so that's, and then there is a, a final CODAB example, which you can also uh, open in CODAB. This web page can be opened in CODAB because it's a Python notebook. 
and then that one actually does the deep learning needed to uh, classify um, the, the MNIST images. And there is a video attached to this one. All right, so if we go back to, if we go back, say, to this, um, so I just went through these uh, links here. And then if you click Homework 2, you will just get the, um, you'll go to Canvas and get the Canvas homework. So <clears throat> are there any questions on that? I just want to make certain you really understand the uh, structure of the class. So we didn't quite have this website up fully running initially, but now it's fully running. And so we will always post things there. But I will also post them on the Canvas announcements. For the Google Collab, uh, do we need to use our personal Google to save to our drive? Sorry? Uh, in the previous, previously mentioned about uh, Google Collab, uh, do we need to use our personal Google account to save uh, a copy in our drive? Well, that's what I do, yes. You, if you don't want it, you can delete it after you've done the exercise. Colab is free in its basic version, which is all you'll need for these simple cases. Also, you can make your own code. You can make your own custom Gmails. I mean, one of my students, because there is a limit of three jobs per Gmail, he has multiple Gmails and runs lots of jobs. Um, so you can you can do whatever you like. All right. Thank you. I don't know how long Goat Lab will last, but it's at the moment one of the best, uh, in my opinion, best lower, lowish end computing environment. And it's powerful enough to do quite a lot of deep learning. All right, so the um, um, videos set for the, I haven't set the homework yet for this week, but the videos for this week are, um, called the big data use cases. And so maybe we could, um, let's go back to here, big data use. Yeah, it's this one here. So this big data use case survey, oh yeah, this is this one here. So it has lots of uh, short videos. Uh, it's divided up into these five to 15 minute videos. It's most of them are that size. And you will see them listed on this page here. So what I did for today is there's more than enough, too much material to go through in a day in a single lecture. I just selected some of the slides. And so I will go through that now as an introduction to the use cases. So that's a different section. So are there any questions before I do that? And as long as the recording works, which I assume it should, I will post these. Uh, I will actually post this particular summary slide deck and the Zoom of my recording me on the uh, on the website. All right. So sometimes with this world moves very fast. And so it's sort of surprised that anything done in 2013 was at all useful. But I pointed out that um, actually everything moves so fast that people don't ever change the past. And so the material is still okay from 2013. It's just maybe it is not studying the latest um, 
natural language processing technology and things like that, but it's actually quite accurate. And in fact, this uh, NIST, which is the uh, US government's National Institute for Standards and Technology, um, it only just, it just f effectively finished this project less than a year ago and published the results that on their website. So there's version three of the survey is published on the website. And that was pretty recent. <coughs> um, okay, so um, let's move on. All right, so, so I just happened to join this because I saw an announce of, uh, an email announcement of this meeting, and it actually was a virtual meeting with by phone. It didn't actually work very well. They messed up the teleconferencing. We didn't have Zooms or things in those days. And um, but most of this work was done actually within six months of that date. And um, NIST is a government organization that is um, often thought of as, as supporting standards, but its sort of goal actually is to support the US industry. And it does that not just by standards, but also by identifying best practices, how to do things. And um, this is, so this is, you all see this meeting has a lot of industry people. Actually, if any of you are in the data science program here, there is only a data science program because of these meetings. Because I went to those meetings and found that many of the industry participants said they were data scientists. So I, I came back to IU and said, hmm, data science is very important in industry. We should offer a, a data science program. And we offered it in January 2014. All right, so this is historically significant. And uh, NIST is always vendor neutral. You will rarely find um, um, very particular implementations. It will always talk about MapReduce usually rather than Hadoop or something or Spark. Because it's trying to be, it's, it is trying to adopt a very neutral attitude and just tell people what's, what's known in particular areas. All right, so there were these um, different subgroups. Nancy Grady, who was from SAIC, she was somebody who said she was a data scientist. Um, and uh, I was doing the use case working group, which most of this material describes. But these other the, of the other ones, the definite the taxonomies, the reference architecture and security and privacy were pretty useful. I, I have a brief discussion of the technology uh, use case with subgroup, but I, I don't do it in, these short, in this short summary. Okay, so here is Nancy Grady's definitions and taxonomy um, subgroup. And it actually sort of discussed definitions. And actually, I think maybe one of you have asked me this, I'm often get asked the question, what is big data? And <clears throat> there are very, very, it was, there is no real agreement on what is big data because big data is more an approach than a size. Although the size of big data tends to imply an approach and the data will, if it's very big, is more likely to have some answer which is not otherwise available. Um, so a lot of these send these possible definitions of big data um, are to do with its size, but um, it is not. I think it's more differentiated, as I've said, by the approach of being data driven rather than the actual size of the data. Here is a reasonably uh, useful definition for those of you in data science. It was one of the first definitions of what data scientist is. And you can see it's sitting here at the intersection of software programming, algorithms, uh, statistics, and domain expertise. So it's in the middle here. Domain expertise, statistics, programming, algorithms. 
So I know we actually use this definition at IU when we were planning the uh, program here. Then there was the reference architecture subgroup, which was probably not as successful. Um, it's not even quite obvious what a reference architecture is because it's um, it basically is a definition of the components which have to be in an architecture. So you can see here it has cloud computing, networking, management, security, transformation, which is very important because all the machine learning is transformation. Then you have sources of data and you're using the data. So these are the blocks for which you um, have to have in any, any processing architecture. And here is that same thing drawn out in a little more detail. Um, here we have the actual machines uh, arranged into clusters. Um, and there is this two terms from, the, from cloud computing, horizontally scalable, that means lots of machines, vertically scalable, which means a very powerful individual machine. And uh, we have platforms like databases and uh, MapReduce. We have processing frameworks like Spark. We have infrastructures like clusters. And then we bring together the collection of the data, the data engineering needed to process the data, the uh, analytics and the visualization. And then we have to access the data. And here is the data consumer, the user, and here is the data provider. And then, or we will see in some later slides, you need to have orchestration. Orchestration is sometimes called workflow. Namely, it is the, if you have a system, it is, has parts. You have to bring those parts together. And that is called orchestrating the system. But I say a lot in several fields that orchestration step is called the workflow because the workflow tells you how to move, take parts and put them together and join them so they're linked typically by data flow between them. The security and privacy work group and in this activity was very strong. Um, and they um, had 10 security challenges, uh, which are a mixture of uh, technologies and best practices like secure data storage, real-time monitoring, access control in with various levels of granularity, auditing, provenance, and so on. And they're linked here and also on the next page here. They're divided into these four areas, infrastructure security, distributed, secure distributed systems. You have to have your storage has to be secure. Data privacy is obviously especially sensitive today with health data being, and also actually education data, FERPA uh, has, is, is uh, relevant. That we have to, everything has to be managed. You need to track what's going on and know what happened. And you need to also monitor with the end-to-end -end validation and real-time monitoring. So they've organized the security features in this fashion. And then they also had 10 use cases, which were different from the other use cases, which I discussed later, which were all from industry. Typically, uh, these security issues are more important for industry than they are for uh, researchers, because if you take uh, a particle physics data, it is not it is not commercially valuable. It is intellectually valuable, but it's not nearly as um, sensitive as um, as uh, your personal health data or proprietary information on the design of your latest vaccine or things like that. Okay, so that was. So anyway, all of these are done in more detail in the um, in the in the slide in the slides which are recorded. Here is the work group I was on the requirements and use work group. 
Um, so I, I guess I, as it says here, this, this particular work had a lot of industry involvement. There were probably more people from industry than academia. Although as I collected the, the 51 use cases, they had, a rather, they had a slight bias. They probably had more academic or research use cases <coughs> than if somebody from industry had collected it. Because my contacts where I could twist people's arms, they were all from research areas. Um, so we actually tried to divide some requirements which would then feed into the uh, uh, architectures. I, we did a lot of work on that, but I don't discuss it much in these lectures. And I don't think it was very, it actually ended up being terribly helpful. Some things that were helpful was capturing patterns. I think they were very useful in identifying common features. Um, and, um, but they weren't so useful in telling you how to build a reference architecture because the reference architecture was so general that I don't think it learned a lot from these, all these special cases. Because they already knew the key things. You had to input data, you had to keep it secure and things like that. You didn't need a use case analysis to, to, to find things at that level. All right, so this is historically interesting. It was the form which uh, my subgroup, we, we had this group of people who formed the use case subgroup. And we um, had weekly meetings. And as a result of those meetings, we produced this uh, template, which told people who had a use case what to do. They had to put the title, put the area, give their email, tell, tell you who cared, like for um, Netflix, the people who cared were the Netflix itself and the, and the customers for research uh, in astronomy, say if there's an astronomy use case, it would be astronomers who cared. Then the goal, the use case description, and then some details of the computing environments and the how, what the data looked like. And then some features of the analysis, um, how, 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 how important was the uh, reliability and robustness of the data, and um, was visualization used and things like that. And then there were some rather vague questions at the end which uh, allowed you to fill in some more details. And if you look at um, the 51, there were actually 54 use cases I found. There were 51 collected in the initial uh, effort and then three more came along later. You could, I'm sure you could, I have tried to make more use cases because there's obviously this 51 is very incomplete, but uh, I've never succeeded. The, the impetus of the NIST effort motivated people to quickly fill in these use cases. And they divided into these one, two, three, four, five, these nine areas, government operations, commercial defense, healthcare, which is a mix of uh, research and commercial, uh, social media and deep learning ecosystem for research, like accelerators and light sources, astronomy and physics, environmental and earth science and energy. All right, so that's the 51 use areas. And in the slide deck that's uh, recorded, it will go through all 51 use cases. Here, I've only done a few of them. And this just tells you a little more detail about the categories. Um, and those, you said, this was 2013 and deep learning was just starting. And so actually we characterized it with social media. Today, you would not have a category called deep learning and social media. You'd have a social media category and you might have a deep learning image processing category or maybe a deep learning, uh, uh, I mean, language translation category, but you wouldn't have this, but 
when we started, uh, we, we uh, I say deep learning was just starting. It was not broadly used. In fact, it was probably not used commercially at the time. Um, and um, so we, ha we had, we didn't, you know, I mean, the government operation is a pretty, uh, it's a specialized sample because we had somebody from the Census Bureau and somebody from the National Archives who were part of this process. And um, so, all right, let's, uh, let's see what we have here. I think after, I think the next step is, so here is just meant to be some example, which I use to, uh, for use cases 23 to 28. And it just summarizes these, some of these properties are from the table. The table defined what the use case was, it defined what the data volume was, the data velocity, the data variety, the software and the analytics. So this is the algorithm. And you can see these M things here are the NIST reports, which contain the details. All each use case uploaded a NIST report with the use case filled in. So we had documented source of data. And um, you can see here about the sizes of data varies from, here's Twitter data, 30 terabytes a, a day. Um, these are, here we have 100 terabytes, but these are not, oh, well, we know images, so we know there are a huge number of images. Uh, 500 billion on Facebook. In, the, in those days, there's now, of course, much more. So these data varies in size. They're terabytes to um, exabytes or zettabytes, presumably, now for, the, uh, for Facebook. And uh, you can see a wide variety of technologies, Hadoop, relational databases, another Hadoop. Uh, um, in the HBase is, a, is an open source um, uh, Apache uh, NoSQL database, which we added indexing to allow it to process uh, Twitter data. Um, all right, so this was just, this just illustrated the type of information that was um, was gotten. And uh, that information was updated. <coughs> and this just, so this describes the update. We I say we, that was called version one. We worked very hard on a version two with a much more complicated template. template which was only in fact used to do three use cases. This last template was a, whereas the first template and project was a huge success, you could say the second version was a huge failure because it didn't get used. Now, technically, for as far as the working group was concerned, it was a success in that we combined the two working groups, the security and privacy and the use case working group so this version of the survey has a lot of security information in it, which is illustrated here. And this is now a much bigger survey. I'll give you an example of it soon. And um, that's probably why it wasn't terribly um, well appreciated because it needed you to do more work. Um, so, that is, a, I give you a link somewhere in these websites to, to, this, um, to this survey. In fact, there's a link here. Um, as I mentioned, we only finished the, this NIST project less than a year ago, and all the documents produced by this NIST working group, which are nine reports, they're at this, they're called their volume three. So in this case, volume three, but this, now we're actually now to set three and they're available here. I also gave you some papers I wrote and a website which summarizes the information. So let me just, um, now I'm gonna do some use cases. Before I do that, 
Let me go through one of the examples by hand. Just a moment. All right, so this was the last use case done a year and a half ago, um, uh, December 2018, and it was for uh, actually a pretty interesting science project. And I just go to this one because it shows you the non-trivial effort involved in filling out version two of the form. It's here being instantiated as a Google Doc, although, uh, and you can see it has even 12 pages. And, um, you, and so you can see here the uh, name of the project, the time, November 2018, the born Miles Deegan filled in uh, this document. He gives URLs. And here he um, describes the so-called stakeholders, which are the uh, SKO is an international organization, which is still being the Observatory is being built in Australia and South Africa. And um, it's also in the lead organization, the lead organization is Drottral Bank, which is the radio uh, astronomy uh, headquarters in the United Kingdom. And it actually, like the, um, the Large Hadron Collider, has a whole set of regional centers around the world, because this is a worldwide collaboration and those regional centers host some of the data and do the processing. So this describes the square kilometer array. And it's an, <clears throat> it, its ambition is enormous, but it has a non-trivial initial step with uh, uh, two uh, telescopes with different um, frequencies. Uh, mid-range frequency and the low frequency, uh, with the low frequency in Australia and the uh, mid-range in South Africa. And uh, they're meant to do everything that radio astronomy does in orders of magnitude better. And I think I already mentioned that key idea is that by having lots of telescopes uh, and you observe them all simultaneously, you can use um, you can use the synchronization between them to remove atmospheric effects. So you get far more reliable answers. And you can build up a giant telescope from merging the results of a lot of little telescopes. And it has some overall software. And uh, there will be a science data processor, which is and they're taking the initial data and um, here is sort of this impressive number. It's going to give you um, 700 petabytes, which is almost an exabyte per year for the, the, some of the two telescopes. And that is, I remember I said that the LHC these days is 100 petabytes. By the time SKA comes online, the Large Hadron Collider will be up around 1,000 petabytes per year. So they're similar in size to the Large Hadron Collider. Collider. And as they don't have any data yet, because they're still being built, um, it uh, will, um, this is all planning, but you know, you, we know the software is very important and the analysis system takes years to build. <clears throat> so, just like the Large Hadron Collider actually built the software system well before the Large Hadron Collider was complete, the same is true of the Square Kilometer Array. They're looking at the algorithms and software. And if you wander around the world, you'll find, I remember I was in Beijing, no, Shanghai, sorry, uh, and there were people at Fudan University working on a Square Kilometer Array. Obviously, the people at Oxford in, in England 
working on square kilometer arrays. So you'll find them everywhere. Um, so it then describes the um, computer system. And you can, I will give you a link to this in the, in the web page for this particular class. And it goes through the storage and the sizing and things like that. And there is at the end a nice picture. You can see how much information there is here, lots of information. And here's their software, Dupe, Spark, MPI, that's the parallel computing software. <coughs> OpenMP is another parallel computing software. Here are the tags which I should be using the the other use cases and <coughs> sorry and there's a picture I'm trying to find at the end okay here's the picture here is low which is Australia here is mid, mid which is South Africa and these go these start, start the low starts off with two better petabytes so it's a very high data rate, which is how it passed through an, inter an immediate processor going down to seven terabytes per second. Of course, seven terabytes per second is quite a lot. And the analysis is measured in hundreds of petaflops per year. A computer of the size, hundreds of petaflops running, running uh, continuously. And this points out these regional centers. You have lots of regional centers, just as the Large Hadron Collider has a center. I mean, like I told you, Indiana University has a, has a tier two uh, regional center for Atlas. You go, so you, so you have Australia and South Africa are the central sites for SKA. Then you go to country, participating country centers and then you go to university centers. And you end up with hundreds of centers devoted to that. Anyway, so that's an example of the use case template and it defines the uh, information needed to um, uh, analyze the SKA data. Let's now come back. I, have, I think I was here. All right, so um, there are about a hundred slides in this slip and slide deck, of which I only have a few. And uh, it basically is the results of this first um, use case survey, which had that much simpler form. And I, I summarize each application in these three categories, what the application is, what the current approach is, the types of compute systems and algorithms, and what the future will be. And then at the bottom here, there are some obscure abbreviations like PP is pleasingly parallel. MR stat means it is using MapReduce for calculating simple statistics. SQ is SQL query. Index is indexing. CF is collaborative filtering. So this actually is a, re this is um, probably a bit old now because it's a census which is just almost complete. But they were pointing out that the census was actually looking at big data techniques because uh, they have the feature that they can't, they're, they're, they're mandated to give a complete census, but often they can't collect a complete amount of data. But you can use collaborative filtering ideas to, um, which is, these are the ideas that allow you to predict what users will want, want to watch what videos. So that same type of idea can be used to complete incomplete forms because you can you, you can compare the parts of the forms that are filled in to find common forms common types of people and then you can use collaborative filtering to estimate what the missing information is so i found that quite an interesting big data application um, here is one actually i wrote this one it was a shit quick summary of Netflix and its application and it's effectively, um, I mentioned here, the A-B testing, how a Netflix 
test new algorithms by running them on part, running the new algorithm for some of the users and comparing it with the old algorithm for a different set of users. And uh, two things, two particular technologies Netflix has are the recommender systems, which uh, I mentioned are nowadays done totally by deep learning, but in those days were done by collaborative filtering. And <clears throat> using things like matrix fluctuate, basic matrix factorization and latent Dirichlet allocation. Um, and Netflix was famous for having a competition, which was sort of a Kegel style competition, where um, the winning competition, which um, combined a hundred different algorithms. And Netflix uses the Amazon cloud service. Um, and of course it has, it has uh, features in common with Amazon in the recommender system and in things like systems like Pandora and iTunes in terms of streaming video delivery. Okay. Here is a timely study. This was written in 2013 and was based on those days on the study of the H1N1 influenza virus. Nowadays, the same group of people from the University of Virginia are using it to study COVID. And I actually work with them on that project. And um, one interesting feature of these types of studies, uh, epidemiological studies of uh, of um, pandemic is that you have to build a, you have to model the people because you're trying to say, I have a collection of people and then things that get done like social distancing or what have you and or non-social distancing. And so to, you need to know where, where, how many people there are, where they are and how they move around. And that's what this synthetic population has. And so you, you take, so that's possibly the hardest part of the project is building that synthetic population. And this means that it's not so easy for people to actually work in this area because unless you have this synthetic population, it's not so easy to run an interesting simulation. So various people have populations, including my colleagues at uh, Virginia and Virginia Tech. And, uh, at the moment, these people are running these simulations 24 hours a day on uh, one of the largest, largest National Science Foundation supercomputers. So they're using a lot of computer time to, uh, under, to, in real, to be able to produce lots of simulations of what if scenarios, which are then fed into the government organizations trying to address COVID. Uh, here is actually something from NIST itself. Uh, I pointed out that the uh, problem set for, for um, last week was involved a study of MNIST. MNIST is the NIST handwriting standard data set, which is used to uh, compare lots of, you, if you go to Amazon and buy a book on deep learning, you'll find lots of them actually based on the MNIST data set, or at least have that as one of their components, because it is one of the best established um, um, labeled data sets, in this case for handwriting. <coughs> and uh, so NIST has a project which is effectively producing benchmarks. And um, they, they, they have that, that handwriting benchmark, but they also have many other benchmarks. And they claim here that they have 30 terabytes of and 100 million tweets and 100 million images and so on. And obviously these images have to be ground truth. They have to have a, a label with them telling you what the image really is. All right, so NIST is, and so it's doing that because benchmarks would be viewed as pre-competitive. They're not uh, particularly, um, it's not something which, uh, something that everybody ought to have so that the 
then the most innovative people can use these benchmarks to design the best possible algorithm for doing something like recognizing self-driving cars and recognizing how to deal with problems and things. Here's another quite, though it's written from 2013, it's still very timely, that is light sources. If you go all around the world from China through the US through Europe, you will find light sources. So these are often are old particle accelerators, physics accelerators, but they're, um, they're no longer being used to study the interactions of say protons on protons, they're being used to study the interaction of photons on, on materials, which are typically either material science oriented or um, biology oriented and um, so these so-called light sources have produced huge amounts of data because every they have the photons hitting the materials that happens presumably with uh, in time intervals measured in seconds or less than a second and then that data is then gathered and has to be analyzed to discover um, what, you know the details of the material and how strong it is and things like that and um, the one I'm, I know, the one in Europe, in the United Kingdom, the Rutherford Lab is called Diamond. It has a dedicated processing, a large processing cluster attached to it. The one in, um, the other one, which is at uh, Argonne, another one at Argonne National Lab is, uh, which is near Chicago, or sort of is Chicago, um, is, uh, attached to the argon supercomputers for analysis. And so the data is transmitted from the accelerator through the, through to the supercomputer and analyzed in real time. Um, and the amount of data here is dramatically increasing because the technology, the uh, cameras which take the photos are now increasing rapidly in resolution. And they say here, they have 39 simultaneous experiments at the Brookhaven light source. So that's, um, there's a lot of data going on here. And uh, I, I say, there's a field called parallel computing, which I used to, well, I still study. So I have some notes on parallel computing here. And um, here, this all oh, you'll find all these big data systems are parallel. This one, you have these little notes in, in the, with yellow backgrounds or yellow orangey backgrounds. Those are comments on the algorithm or the parallelism. Here it says parallel, pleasingly parallel parallelism over images. Uh, here is one which I have several slides on, partly because I, I worked on it for a dozen years is the uh, color grid application, which I have I mentioned color grid, which is a cluster we installed at Indiana. It's now retired, but uh, when in 2008 we installed it, it was a state-of-the-art system. And it was used for analyzing um, this radar data. And the radar data is used to make UV forecasts for uh, the so-called IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And uh, it basically measures the structure of the ice sheets and those can be fed into other simulations which tell you how the water and ice flows in ice sheets. And as the, as the um, bottom of the ice sheet is uh, a kilometer or so down, you can't you need something like radar which can go through the ice and bounce off the bottom to understand it. <coughs> Now this is actually a typical science problem and it it's, has so-called expeditions. You have a, you have a, in the case of uh, Croesus, they would have field trips where they would go to uh, Arctic or uh, typically the Arctic, not the Antarctic, but they can go to the Antarctic as well, gather data for a month or two um, and then stop and then come back in this case, in their case to Kansas and analyze it. And so the data was always grouped in, um, in uh, subsets. Now in the case of say the Large Hadron Collider, there's a similar grouping because the Large Hadron Collider doesn't run 24 hours a day 
365 days per year, it runs in various um, operational um, units. And uh, here is actually a reasonably um, interesting piece of data showing this is here is an aircraft. Here is the top of an ice sheet. And here is the bottom of the glacier. And this distance here is three kilometers. So you can see that here is the signal from the radar, which, um, and you can see it actually is pretty confusing. Here at the bottom is the bottom, and it's pretty fortunately quite strong here. But there are all sorts of confusing signals, which you have to disentangle when you do the analysis. So this, this, this experiment, like many experiments, actually produces images. These images uh, uh, effectively represent the radar signal, the result of the radar processing. And uh, you have to analyze these signals to decide which are essentially irrelevant um, reflections and what is the real signal. And this thing here at the bottom is the real signal. This one is pretty clear, even though there are a lot of reflections. However, other ones are by no means as clear. Um, so this shows us some sort of um, interesting feature of this. Um, um, this must be Greenland. And um, you can see these red lines here are just the the flight paths of the aircraft. These, most of this data is taken from aircraft because you can then fly over the ice sheets and the fact that the aircraft is not on the ground. If the, what you're looking for is three kilometers down, it doesn't really matter whether you're up in the air or sitting on the ice sheet on a, with your SUV. So anyway, you map, you, you, you just, this is the, um, they have a couple of aircraft, a Twin Otter, a small aircraft, and a DC-8, which is a bit bigger, although pretty old, of course. Here is a cleaner data. And so you can see there are, here is the bottom. Actually, it's sort of interesting how ragged the bottom of a, of a glacier is. And you can see when you, the, the, this structure here is going to actually impede the flow of the ice and slow it down. And um, the purpose of these experiments is to find the green line and the red line, because the difference is the depth of the glacier. The green line is the top of the glacier, the red line is the bottom, which in this case is um, clear. I should say that um, We automated this. We produced deep, actually deep learning algorithms, which automatically found the green and the red line. Before those automatic methods, they were done by undergraduates working during this, working, working to just by hand put little dots here to tell the system that this was the bottom and this was the top. Um, so this actually was. Uh, we still work with them. This was a summary of this work from February of this year. And let um, <clears throat> me say the software which we produced in our project at Indiana, uh, with in collaboration with Kansas, is now really is actually used in production by not only Kansas, but by other groups in this area. And um, here you can probably hardly see it, but you can see here a lot of lines. So this is the current work, which is not looking at um, reflections off the bottom of a glacier, is looking at reflections off uh, annual snow accumulations. So if you, um, if you, snow, if you have a snowfall every year, you get things like, <coughs> like uh, rings in trees. You get layers in the snow because it freezes and that produces a sharp layer. And so you can actually, if you, if, you, if, you, if you take in the right wavelength, which is a lower wavelength than the one needed for doing the, um, the three kilometer down, uh, one, one to three kilometer down glacier basin, if you're just looking down 
meet us into the into the uh, into the um, snow into the ice sheets, then you would want a lower wavelength um, radar signature, and then you can get these lines. And so you have to try to do this much harder problem instead of trying to predict two lines, the top of the glacier and the bottom. You try to predict lots of lines, which are the different snow, different year annual uh, snow signals. All right, so this is actually number 51, which is the last of the ones in the in this note in these um, um, use case studies. And actually, this is in the area of energy. We only have one energy um, use case in this published set. We have another one which didn't get published because it never got completed. That was actually a, a nearer, I mean, the more hard, mainstream. Uh, oil industry application where they're actually taking data, seismic data to try to identify regions where there will be oil and gas. This one is a different energy application which is analyzing smart grids and it is taking data from smart from uh, sensors on the on the electrical grid and it is trying to predict energy consumption um, and um, by taking this data, which occurs every 15 minutes. And this is well, there are 1.4 million sensors in Los Angeles associated with the electrical grid. So you can see if there's 1.4 million in Los Angeles, that's, um, that's going to be over the country, country an enormous number, uh, maybe 50 times more sensors than are associated with the electrical power grid. And of course, the hope is that by doing this, you can avoid uh, unnecessary uh, shutdowns and power surges and things like that. I mentioned already parallel computing. So this one now on uh, slide deck three. And slide deck three looks, sort of analyzes the structure of the applications and um, one aspect which is, uh, I say everything is parallel, and uh, but the things are parallel over different things, like uh, Netflix is parallel over the videos which are accessing. It's also parallel over the users who are accessing the video. So that is quite common that you have two forms of parallelism, and which are over items and people. But uh, different um, different applications are parallel over different different aspects. Um, okay, yeah, the I said the image cases are typically parallel over the the images, like the light source data, or even the creases data. They produce or produce streams of images. Then we have what I call the. Uh, Problem architecture, this, how it looks. Um, and uh, this also tells you how many there are of each type in the 51. So there were meant to be eight, which are pleasingly parallel, which meant that um, the job consists of totally independent um, processing of every item. There is map produced, which you could say is like the, that energy problem. You process each of the 1.4 million sensors and then you add them up and accumulate them and analyze the, the differences between them. That's MapReduce. And some of those are just simple additions and things, classic statistics. Others are gonna be more complicated, say uh, like the collaborative filtering. When you do the more collaborative, you will actually need to do iterative MapReduce because MapReduce in its classic fashion does not do machine learning algorithms. Some are graph, some fuse information together. And one interesting feature is how much of this data is streaming. I pointed out the, um, um, well, a lot of the data, like the um, electrical grid data, it's streaming. Every sensor is sending its data back to headquarters uh, at every at every 15 minutes. So each day, each day you have 1.4 million uh, streaming 
independent streaming data sets. And so that produces a non-trivial um, analysis task. If you like Apache software, that's what Apache Storm processes or Apache Heron. Um, so this actually describes these different forms of MapReduce. I pointed out the pleasingly parallel form up here, which I sometimes call map only, because map is the computation and reduce is the exchange of information, such as adding them together. And then iterative map reduce does this step here and then loops back to the beginning again. That's what you get when you do parallel matrix algebra. If you process graphs, you will get this map point to point communication because when you have a graph, you have independent items joined by special links. And you don't, and instead of typically an ordinary map reduce, you do broadcasts so that all data receives the result because you're adding everything together, say. In the case of a graph, you're just linking vertices in the graph. So they have a very distinctive communication pattern. Streaming is uh, important, I pointed out. That's when you have possibly just the classic MapReduce architecture, but the data is not fixed and like it is if it comes from a repository, but it's streaming in. And typically if you stream in data, you have to broker it and buffer it. And so that's what these brokers here are doing. Uh, here is shared memory. So especially for the graph problem, you may need giant memories and you tend to run multiple cores all accessing the same memory. And um, so here is the classification of the algorithms, search and query, SQ index for indexing and collaborative filtering and so on. Um, and so here I list the, some of those. And if you go to the web, the side deck, it tells you for each application, what are, the, what are these uh, computational type. And, um, and then, then you have the overall structure, which includes this um, host of lots of sensors, pleasingly parallel, uh, use of simulations together with data and so on. <coughs> Classical database, the uh, government operations, which were the sensors and the national archives are built around classical database. I did some work around this time on classifying all these use cases and other use cases. And I made a list of, which were called the ogres. Um, that's because other people call these things dwarves and giants. So we uh, called these ogres. And we uh, made this picture here, which is uh, somehow 50 different characteristics of problems, such as they involve high performance simulations. They involve classic map reduce. Uh, the, uh, the, the computing is of order the square of the number of points. We have things like, what is the volume of data? That's a feature. So here we have 50 features, which as far as I know is the best collection of features there is in the world. And here we have actually an extended set and they actually were used not just to classify um, big data, but also big simulations. And so they tended to add simulation algorithms over here and simulation technologies over here. The data and the architecture are essentially unchanged. And those are described in their quarter convergent diamonds. Um, and uh, they have again these four different axes on which the features are divided. The last, uh, which we should be coming up to, the last uh, slides in this uh, in this summary deck uh, come from slide deck four, and this was work done in the NIST thing. To remember, NIST is trying to find best practice. So one aspect of best practice is try to find patterns. Right, your job is like this other job, and so here, <coughs> here we have a class, a pattern which says you have a database and you generate a SQL query on that database. So you have the data going to some fixed storage. Then you have a database engine, which um, 
Hadoop's Oracle, Hive, Hadoop, or Apache Drill. That, uh, that is uh, supports SQL queries, and then you, here you have the happy users or not so happy users generating a SQL query. So that's one pattern. Here is a more scientifically oriented pattern, which I'm be more familiar with. You have data coming in, and I pointed out that in field science, you often accumulate data in expeditions. In the case of uh, Acresis, the data was written to disks, and those disks were then loaded in batch fashion onto the computer. So here we have the data storage, either directly streamed in for scientific study at Twitter, or done in batches for particle physics or, or um, precis and astronomy is often streamed in because you just have data coming from the telescopes and you're actually looking for, you know, you're looking for supernovas so that when one telescope sees a supernova, you immediately send a message to all other telescopes to focus on it. And here we have some Programming environments such as Spark or Hadoop or Giraffe is a graph processing environment. Pig is a, a, a sits on top of Hadoop, and then that manages the, the analysis code. And it says Mahout, which is out of date nowadays. It would be a deep learning, so it should say TensorFlow and PyTorch if you drew this picture today. And then as an example, we have the particle physics, which takes this model and as I said, spreads it over multiple tiers of processing capabilities. The tier zero is the accelerator itself at CERN in Switzerland or Switzerland says France. We have the national ones, which are at Fermilab for the US, uh, Rutherford Lab in the United Kingdom, this INFN, we get now whether that's Italy or France, probably Italy. Uh, maybe from, I don't know which one it is. Anyway, Italy has one, France has one, and they pour out to these uh, national centers, but then distribute them to sub centers. And here we're nearing the end of this. Um, and we have here visualization. We, so we have actually the same model as before storage, processing. Analytics, and then we go the analytics produces answers, which is visualization. And th remember, I talked about orchestration. So this has orchestration, which orchestrates the work done on the analysis, the work done by the visualizer. So you specify the analytics, and you look at the answer. And the last slide, last but one slide, is a variant of this where you, um, which um, Actually, it's this one here. The last slide is, is this, which has the orchestration done in more detail, where you might run multiple analysis programs, one of which could be visualization. So this is identical to before, except you have lots of different analytics, and they all have to be linked together by orchestration. And orchestration or workflow is pretty important. And so here's the one I didn't look at, which is the, effectively the last slide, which is the, uh, the classic ETL, extract, load, transform, uh, industry application, first transferring data from one, one archive into another. All right, so I went through the four slide decks in um, use cases, the definition of the process, slide deck one, the 51 use cases, slide deck two, the features of the 51 use cases, uh, slide deck three, and the 10 patterns which describe the use cases, slide deck four. All right, so I will set the homework later today or tomorrow. And uh, so that's, that's the uh, end of, the, of my summary presentation, which was meant to um, describe this week's um, uh, lectures, I said, I, whereas for the introduction, I went through all lectures in the introduction, but here, I did not go through all lectures of the, of the four slide decks. All right, so any questions?
Questions? No questions. Well, if you have any questions, just send me an email. But um, please use the uh, website and tell me if there are any problems. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.